Henry from Metro talking about the, our, the regional trails program. I'm going to send around this to the students who need to check in that they're here. And without further ado, we'll start. Yeah, up. So does this go to 1.30 or 1 o'clock? 1.30. 1.30, okay. I'm going to go through a, oh hi, <laughs> I know more people in this audience than I think. I'm Mel Hugh and I work for Metro in the Parks and Green Spaces Department. And my position there is the Regional Trails Coordinator. So we put together a plan for recreational and commuter trails that would encompass the whole four county area. And it'll be, it's this map that Morgan is putting up on the wall is in the brochure, which uh, we'll go over. So does everyone know what Metro does and what we are? Okay. I guess I have to stand over here. Huh? Maybe briefly. Briefly, okay. Metro is the regional government for the Portland metro area, this side. And we do land use planning. We, we run the zoo and we do the... Uh, Garbage disposal and solid waste. So the, the landfill for this here, all your garbage goes to Central Oregon. This is in Gillen County. And we do stream protection and green spaces, which is, I'm in this department. And we also run the convention center and all the regional arts facilities, like the Performing Arts Center up here. And even PG Park are under Metro, because that used to be at the city, so the whole idea was to consolidate city functions that are really regional under Metro. We have a great GIS DRC, Data Resources Center Department. So you can kind of see the urbanized area. This is kind of the Metro boundaries. But within Metro, there are actually areas that are rural and farm, and those are usually on the edges, and eventually those will become urbanized. But you can kind of see the gap. Here's Forest Grove and Cornelius, and Hillsboro is kind of here. So you could see there's a gap there because that's all farmland. And you could see the gap between Wilsonville and the south end of the metro area. And over here, just to let you know, southeast, the Damascus and Pleasant Valley areas up here, those will be within this edge of metro that used to be farm use, it's going to become urbanized over the next 20 years in this little quadrant up here. And here's the Metro 2040, the 50-year concept plan that we started in the 90s. And this is the whole region, and you can see we're focusing on regional centers. Here's the central city, regional centers such as Gateway, Town Center, Washington Square, and there are various uh, town centers in Main Street. So I'm sure, and these are the light rail lines. Here's the Interstate Max, here's the East Side Line, and here's the airport extension. So Metro has spent a lot of time planning where growth would go, but the, each local city does all the detailed planning. So my goal is to put regional trails as alternative transportation routes to connect all the cities together and to connect all these main streets. Have you guys talked about this in your classes? At okay. But specifically, I'm going to focus it on green spaces and trails. And we do have a master plan that was put together in 1992. And that kind of outlined, it did an inventory of where all the natural areas were back then, 10 years ago, and which ones we would acquire. So over the last 11 years, Metro has acquired 8,000 acres of natural areas for the public. And those are all still land bank because we don't have enough money to develop and open them up. So again, we focus in on like stream protection, water resources, uh, wildlife and birds, and habitat, and kind of natural areas type passive recreation such as hiking, fishing, camping. Uh, our program does not deal with active 
recreation such as tennis, swimming, basketball, all those traditional things which were done at the city level. And the whole program started in the late 80s because a lot of the cities and counties got together at Metro and said, well, these are things we want to do, but natural areas and streams and trails we cross city and county lines, and is there a way we can work together? So this whole plan was put together by a committee of all the city and county and park district planners and officials. Again, we highlight on the natural resources. And here's our actual system concept map, and it shows the dark green are the publicly owned natural areas. Here's Forest Park. And that was acquired by the city in the late 40s through a foreclosure of the developer. They, a developer wanted to put houses up there right after the war. And he just went, built. luckily, he went bankrupt. You'd think after the war with all the demand for new housing. But it was obviously a very difficult site to develop and to provide public services. So through the foreclosure, the city of Portland obtained Forest Park. It's just the largest urban natural area within city boundaries in the whole United States. Okay, And here's the Smith and Bybee Lakes natural area. This whole area before World War II was all wetlands, all sloughs. And, there, and during the war, they built Vanport, the city that, within a city that built all the uh, ships during the war, which flooded out in 48. But after 48, the port of Portland, for the last 40 years, have, 50 years, have been putting in uh, their docks and everything. So that area is highly disturbed. So there is a remnant of natural areas along the Columbia Slough that Metro and the city are working to protect. And see this island, if you ever go across 205 Government Island, that's been purchased by Metro. So the only way to get there is by boat. And believe it or not, it used to be a grazing area. Have you ever seen the cows on Government Island? It's kind of weird <laughs> to see. And here's the, uh, the delta area where the Sandy River runs into the Columbia. So this has been obtained. And there's some really brown fields up here, too, the old Reynolds aluminum plant that have, based on the world economy and the cost of electricity, they've all went bankrupt. And you know all the steel production is now pretty much in Asia. So kind of going a clockwise loop here, the Oxbow Regional Park is out here. And the East Buttes are out here. So Metro has been working with Gresham, Portland, Multnomah and Clackamas counties to uh, purchase those tops of the bluffs that you see when you go down 205. So here's uh, Mount Talbert. It's a good comparison to Mount Scott. If you drive down 205 towards town center, you can see one view that it, it has not been protected. So it's got upscale, you know, 3,000 square foot houses on 50 by 100 lots. They're very large. And it's steep, and they have roads that just go straight up Mount Scott. But just south of that is Mount Talbert, which Metro purchased, and that's being protected as a natural area. And again, I, I'm kind of showing you this loop of green spaces because our, the concept is to have a regional trail system, not only to connect the cities and the town centers and the neighborhoods, but also to loop Powell Butte to this area to Smith and Bybee Lakes, to Kelly Point Park, then across the St. John's Bridge to Forest Park, then up to Sovies Island, so you can access all those by bicycle. And here are the tools Metro and the other cities are using to protect and manage green spaces and trails. Of course, there's the old-fashioned way you just buy the land or right away from a willing seller, which just is very expensive. Prices <laughs> have just gone even the last 10 years, the prices have gone up very high. Environmental education to teach people, volunteer stewardship to teach property owners, many who live on creeks and streams, on how to manage their property, like even how they mow their grass and what they spray on it, and to plant native vegetation along the stream banks, and how to deal with stormwater runoff off their roof. Then there's the long-term planning, which Metro and the cities, we all have to have 
20 and 50 year plans, but it's nice that you guys will be around for the 20 year, 50 year plans, so that's good for you guys. And of course there's regulation which is more controversial, like the Metro and the State Go 5 program which requires an inventory of natural areas and open spaces and to regulate. So, and you don't compensate any property owners for that. So that's always, uh, if you go to the Metro website, there's a whole section on goal five, which you may have studied. Have you guys studied that in any of your classes? Okay. Yeah. Goal five is required by the state. The good news is in 95, remember we did the master plan in 92? So it, eight years ago, we passed a $135 million bond measure for open space and trails as well as a hundred local projects, local green space projects. In that past, it was like 66% yes eight years ago, which is an amazing amount. So we, we par we've essentially spent all this, this bought that 8,000 acres that I mentioned earlier. And this is the same piece in your brochure. And these are the trails. Of course, the solid lines are in the distinct minority because those are the ones we already have. And we do have a lot of dotted lines, which is the 50-year vision to have this, see this whole system that goes in a circular loop. The whole idea is to have loop trails, nothing that dead ends. And we'll go over some of these that are coming up for planning in the next five years. This is a concept map, so it's very long term. But the neat thing is you'd connect Wilsonville in the south all the way up to Forest Park. Then you could come down across the St. John's Bridge. See this? You'd be at the confluence of the Willamette and the Columbia. So you have a trail all the way there long term. And a lot of this is a power line right away, so you literally have a corridor there. It's just a matter of working with those other government agencies to get a trail through a lot of this corridor. And some of the trail through this whole north-south trail is already there. So these are, this one's realistic in the next 10 to 15 years. More exciting is what's on the east side of the Willamette River. You already have a trail from the Selwood Bridge all the way downtown to the Steel Bridge, and you've got Tom McCall Park Trail all the way down to the Selwood Bridge, plus the new developments going on the south waterfront will mandate a bike and pedestrian trail. That's all going to happen. So pretty much this thing, you could ride your bike today from the steel bridge down the Selwood Bridge and come all the way back and just go off street a few blocks by the spaghetti factory. Has everyone been on the, uh, the OMSI to Springwater Trail, which is down the, I highly recommend that. And during your lunch break, it's easy to do the Hawthorne Bridge to the steel bridge loop in that if, you do, if you're jogging or walking, that's, the round trip is just under three miles, so you can kind of tabulate how much you walk. And during lunch, a lot of the office workers from Lloyd District and downtown are using this, this inner city loop right here. And when they build this south waterfront, which they just had the groundbreaking earlier this week, the city and the developer compromise, there's gonna be the river, then a riparian zone to protect the water and habitat. Then there'll be a pedestrian trail just for people walking. Then there'll be another vegetative buffer. Then there'll be a bike trail. Then there'll be the buildings. So there will be a lot of public recreation and a, a commuter trail in that very upscale area that the tram is coming down from the hospital. And some of these far out suburban areas, you know, even these suburban cities, Wilsonville, that's very, suburb, quote, suburban, but yet they're putting together a, a commuter and recreational trail system in that city. The old uh, state hospital is in Wilsonville. It's been closed for a few years, and it was just a huge vacant land. The state sold that to a developer. The company that did Orenco on the Max line is the developer there, and that's going to be a huge town center, and, the, and I'm working with the developer to put a trail on the edge of their property, and that'll connect down to other properties that Metro and Wilsonville have purchased. 
So if you ever saw One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, the, that movie, some of it was filmed there and in Salem. But of course, you know, this is kind of a double entendre. It, it means healthy communities, livable communities, and healthier people. Because I guess the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, actually Oregon has a very high obesity rate and heart, I mean, our state has a very high, you know, bad record on medical statistics, interesting enough, even though you wouldn't think that off the top of your head. So I'm starting to work with insurance companies and hospitals to get information out to walk on trails. And you know, hospitals are putting in little gardens in their facilities so the patients can see the trees and stuff so they, they get better quicker. And there's a whole thing about encouraging walking and biking on trails. And I'm actually working with a lot of senior centers that are within a trail. There's a trail in, a planned trail in Clackamas County that is within five blocks of the largest concentration of uh, retirement homes in the whole state. And of course you get people out of their cars because a lot of people are actually commuting to work. And it, you know we're having greenways also that provides the habitat for fish and wildlife. And of course, as, if you study all your Main Street planning in your classes or if you're out in the community, you'll see that the Pearl District, the River District, downtown Gresham and Hillsborough, they're geared to trying to get people to walk and to do daily errands instead of driving just to the big box stores or the Fred Myers. And I want to tell you that the trail system is really a road-separated system. But I work cooperatively with the planners who put the bike lanes, the stripes, and the sidewalks that are in the right-of-way. So ours are kind of nice. We're planning 950 miles. This whole map adds up to about 950 miles of greenways and trails. And that's obviously a big, long-term vision. So everyone's, all the planners and jurisdictions have agreed to this. And to date, we have about 155 miles that are separated from the roads that are open to the public today. And across the river, actually, you should go over to, how many people go over to Vancouver, Clark County? They have a very good system of trails over there in parks that a lot of people are not utilizing from this side of the river. Just, this is in Troutdale. Believe it or not, this is on Beaver Creek Canyon, and it's just a deep canyon. They have a boardwalk trail down into the canyon. But beyond all these trees, though, in the last 10 years, there's like huge subdivisions of houses. But you know, we, c we have to protect the remnants, and this is obviously not developable for housing, so this has been saved as a public trail and park. And here's down on the Hawthorne Bridge. Here's that loop that goes south. But the whole concept is not new. It started in 1903, 100 years ago, as a, uh, as a radical concept by the Olmsted brother, landscape architects. The city hired them in 1903 to put together a park and trail plan for Portland. So that's why we still use this term, the 40-mile loop. You may have heard of that. And it's more like 140 miles connecting 30 parks. Did some of you go to the Olmsted Conference in Portland in April? So we talked heavily about this. And if you go to the Portland Parks website, there's a lot of information on the 40-mile loop and the Olmsted plan. And I'm kind of going to take you on a tour of certain trails. This is the Springwater Corridor, which goes from the river all the way east towards Mount Hood. It literally connects up, it will connect up to the Pacific Crest Trail that goes the whole length of the United States. So currently, these are open to the public, very easy to use, 14 miles from the river all the way east to Boring, Oregon, which is east of Gresham. Yeah, how far along are you on the Three Bridges project to connect that spring water to the river? Um, 
we, I've got slides on that. We are planning, we're in the midst of the planning. We will have the design for those bridges, preliminary design in December. And our goal is to complete the three bridges in three years. So the summer to fall of 2006, they'll be done. Oh, feel free to just ask questions during this instead of at the end. And this, this used to be a streetcar line. You can kind of tell it's nice and flat and straight. So the trail was put on an old railroad ballast here, and these are the shoulders for equestrian users. And this is, of course, looking east. But it's, besides it being a railroad corridor, it's a public utility corridor. These are PGE poles and transmission towers. And all this electricity comes from three to four dams up on the Clackamas River owned by PGE. And this is how this streetcar line was started in the eight, late 1800s. It got lumbermen up to where the trees were. It got people out to get out of the city. And even getting out of the city meant Oaks Park down here by the Selwood Bridge because they had the amusement park was there at the turn of the century. and they. It was all lit up at night. It was like the white city at night. So a lot of people would just even take the streetcar out to uh, Oaks Amusement Park. And what's neat about this, we're taking an old transportation corridor and making it into a recreation and commuter corridor today. Portland had the most extensive network of streetcar lines. And I don't know if you study that in your transportation classes. We had this huge network of lines from Portland, Oregon City, to Gresham, to Troutdale, to Beaverton, to Newburgh, McMinnville, to Vancouver. And most of those have been lost, just paved over by development. But where we could save the corridors, like corridors that, this had streetcars on it till like 1950 something. And it had freight service until the 80s, believe it or not. So in like the late 80s, the city and the state got this from the railroad to keep as a corridor. And here is, this is this slide you just show, I just showed you. So it connects all the way. It's done to boring. It's pretty much done to here right now. But from where the dot is all the way south to Estacada, it's owned by the state of Oregon Parks already, it just has not been developed. And there's a lot of ravines and trestles that have fallen down in disrepair. But see this, I call it the Esplanade, East Bank Esplanade to Estacada Trail. And Estacada, a small rural old lumbering community, they've already actually finished their section of the trail, which is right next to the uh, Clackamas River. Then from here, this is where all those PGE dams are by the river. And I went out there last year after September 11th, and still they haven't really, you can still walk across. A lot of those dams have public trails right over them. I mean, there's old roads next to the dams that are public that have just been closed because they built new roads. So they could actually be trail corridors. And of course, if someday if the city buys PG, that'll all be public, yeah. John? Do you know how uh, far the original rail line went to? Like, did it end in Estacada, or like, what, how far does it go? It went through this, this corridor is called the old Casadero right here. So it went to, definitely to Casadero. But I believe it went to Estacada. But I've got a map in my office if you ever want to come see it. Off the top of my head, I think it comes to Estacada, but I know it came down to here to an area called Casadero. And in the this map I have, it actually has the old stations where it stopped. And these other, these lighter lines show the other trails. So you could see how the Springwater Trail connects to like the I-205 bike lanes. The this is the old Barlow Trail the pioneers came on. This is the most recent section, the section along the Willamette River. So it's a trail with a railroad line, so we had to put a fence into it. These are very, they take a long time. It took 10 years to f buy all this land and to get the trail in because the railroad operator was hesitant to allow a trail down there. 
because he was worried about people getting hit by his train, so we compromised and put a, a fence in between. So it's three miles, fr roughly, from where the Ross Island Bridge starts down to the Selwood Bridge. And it's, I really encourage you to go this weekend because of the fall, the leaves and everything. It's really beautiful. And just to let you know, another good time to go coming up would be the, when all the leaves fall off, it's amazing how much you see. You'll see Ross Island, you'll see the river. And you know Ross Island's going to become a city park over the next five years. They're not going to dredge it, but the Ross Island cement plant will stay. Hopefully that will move out eventually too. How many people have been on this trail? Yeah. And here's that link. See, and this is that loop I <coughs> talked about. This is all done. See, the, that's the Ross Island, but the Hawthorne Bridge is up here. And for you future planners here, the, you know, the Milwaukee line, which is not funded, the light rail, you know, they funded the 205 line. That's going to be built. But they eventually still want one from downtown across the new bridge at Carruthers Street and to follow the old railroad tracks that are kind of in this area all the way into downtown Milwaukee and terminate there. And this is the Three Bridges project. This is McLaughlin. Currently, there used to be three bridges over Johnson Creek, McLaughlin, and a railroad track that was for the train of the old Springwater line. There used to be a railroad bridge here. But now, we're going to rebuild those bridges for pedestrian and bike users. And this is all federally funded, essentially. It was the biggest transportation grant for a bike ped project. And it will be complete in three years from now. Quick question. Um, do you know uh, when they're designing those bridges, are they keeping um, uh, right of way space open for that South Max that would come into, into yes. Milwaukee? See this, this blue line? That's the extent of a bridge, and the solid yellow is a trail. So see that? We've extended the bridge over beyond the street for the future MAX. So the MAX line could go here. They told us it would go there. Then they're saying, oh, it might go there, too. So we have enough space. See that? And this is 99E or McLaughlin. Selwood and Westmoreland, Portland are over here. So this is kind of that extent of the three bridges, Johnson Creek, McLaughlin, and the railroad. If you ever take the train to San Francisco, this is the way you go. And downtown Milwaukee's right literally here. So this is going to have thousands of people using it because then you have the spring, you know, downtown's right here. So there's just like a 15 block gap here that we're working on and these three bridges are going to be built in three years. And we have to do a lot of environmental protection because we're going over an ESA creek here with the salmon. And so this bridge is going to be kind of a modern unique design arched bridge. But it, we're going to come up with the final designs this December. And this is, I mentioned, the, the eastern section where you're out really, out here you're, this is definitely a recreational trail east of Estacada. And the state already owns that. They tried to do some planning 12 or 13 years ago, but the, a certain section that property owners just became unglued, like violent. So they, <laughs> it's kind of been sitting there. And I'm trying to get the state and Clackamas County and Estacada to start pushing for that. See, this would connect you to the Pacific Crest Trail. And this is the map of that section. It's quite beautiful. Beyond Estacada, you're essentially in the Mount Hood National Forest area, and they have trails there. And here's another trail called the Trolley Trail. This is essentially the streetcar line that went from downtown Portland to Oregon City via Milwaukee and Gladstone. Okay, and we've just we finished that first section. The first section of this line is this that Omsi to Springwater, which you saw earlier, 
that section stands so then it comes this is this section here on, on the regional plan. So it's six miles that Metro bought just two years ago from Union Pacific. It's like 40 feet wide and it's kind of a de facto or demand trail. People have been using it for years. Kids use it, adults use it, but we want to make that into a, a nice trail over the next five years. So we're working with North Clackamas Parks City of Milwaukee and the Friends of the Trolley Trail group to go from here to there. And if you ever want to ride this car, this little, this streetcar is still in service on the Willamette shoreline in the summer, down here from River Place to Lake Oswego. It's pushed by a, a diesel engine, but it's literally this car. And this is the old s station down in Oak Grove in about 1955 or so. And I t this is the area where you have a lot of senior and retirement homes, uh, people who are still very active. And while the senior groups want to have a safe, they don't want to walk in a striped area next to the street. They want to have a separated trail that's you know ADA accessible. So this this will be a very nice stretch. And this is I call this the stretch of Clackamas County that doesn't look like the suburbs. It's an old community of Oak Grove and it was built around, it's a streetcar suburb, it was built, people wanted to be next to this corridor because that's where the streetcar was to Portland. And they have very nice big lots, lots of trees, big old houses, so that's, it's a very nice area, whereas if you've been down McLaughlin, which is your traditional commercial strip development where you need a car to cross the street, kind of. And it'll connect up to Oregon City because there's an existing bike ped bridge over the Clackamas River. And Oregon City is doing all these trail loops in their downtown area. They see it as economic development to have trails and tourism in Oregon City. And here's the 205. And here's up to the future Sullivan's Gulch 84 Trail, Morgan's Trail up there. <laughs> I'm, I'm not retiring until Morgan gets its trail. <laughs> this is the Willamette Shoreline Rail with Trail, and this is that seven mile. This is going to be an amazing corridor, even if a trail doesn't go there. It's definitely going to have some type of streetcar. You know the Central City streetcar right out here? It's going to River Place in the next two years. They're building it now. Then the goal is to get it down to the new south waterfront area where all the high-rise luxury condos are going. But the whole goal is to, we're currently doing a study to see if passenger rail transit, not heavy max lines, but central city streetcar scale and possibly a trail. It's very difficult because there's a tunnel and trestles where you're right on the river. So it's, it's, if we only had 10 more feet even, we could have done both for sure. So that's going to be kind of an interesting little study over the next two years. So, yeah. Um, on the tunnel there, has anybody considered boring it bigger? Is that not an option? Uh, I don't know, but that's something to send in to us as we do that study. But that's going to be difficult. Plus, you've got a lot of very, very affluent people the Dunthorpe, the Dunthorpians, I call them, which that's the most upscale neighborhood in the whole state. And this, has anyone ridden that trolley line? You literally can touch their bedrooms and their estates, and their, it's a very grand area. Your whole class, you should rent, you can actually rent one of these cars, and if you rent the car as a group, they'll stop along the line, whereas if you're just going on the regular route. It's, it's not in business till next s spring. They won't, they can't stop. But that's an interesting, I doubt it because that is under Elk Rock where the old, there's an estate above that. And it's really solid. And a lot of the people are fighting to keep the rail out, let alone a rail with a trail. But even if the rail, you know, if that wasn't there, which I support streetcar development there myself, it is the perfect trail corridor because you're kind of, if you look out the front of the train when you're going down, it just fits perfectly for a trail. And you've got a lot of bisecting people. A lot of people have to cross this to get to their house. There's a lot of houses down there 
along the river on stilts. So their only way to get across to their house by car or by foot is to cross this thing. So when this streetcar goes down, they'll have to time all the crossings because currently this, it takes a long time to get there because it's an old car, but it has to stop at every street crossing. Yeah. What Metro is doing the feasibility studies, uh, things like uh, cost and the benefit studies, how do you measure the benefit of putting up a new trail? I'm thinking, you know, besides usage, things like uh, the improvement in physical health is yeah. very hard to justify. Yeah, how, or how do you how do you find out if those people got healthy? Because who knows where they live and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, like besides uh, the usage, which is uh, very easy to monitor. What are other indicators? That you well, measure? the other indicators are property values adjacent to a trail or greenway, which is a set cost. Because there, I mean, it's good if if you live there and you want to sell, because your prices go up. But if you don't want to sell and you want you pay more taxes because the value goes up. But that is a, that's what they're doing. I've seen real estate ads say next to a trail, next to Greenway, buy this house. And a lot of people like to buy a house next to a Greenway, particularly if it doesn't have access because it has a lot of privacy. But a lot of people actually like to be next to a walking trail. So that's, you're right, it is difficult to come up with all these statistics to justify a trail. But the other thing is they actually have all these models, computer models, and they also look at how many cars are estimated not to be used by the usage. So they calculate this thing about the improvement to air quality. But Morgan, call me about that, because even though this is geared for planners and officials, I think the more citizens who get involved in this. Because I know Lake Oswego really wants the streetcar and a trail if possible. Has anyone been to Lake Oswego in the last five months? You should, t it's, a, it's like a village of three and four story buildings finally. They're actually doing, it's very expensive of course, but it's, gone, it's moving to a very nice urban village. So I highly recommend you going out there. Plus it's, you know, on this map, Lake Oswego, you go through Tryon Creek State Park. There's a lot of natural areas, these, these trails that go to Lake Oswego. I think the downtown is, is quite nice, and it's an area that you would want to walk on, and especially if you could ride your bike. If nothing else, we're going to allow... Currently, though, excuse me, the European streetcar, you can't put a bicycle on. Too small. But it has that nice feel. But I was trying to figure out how could you get down there with a bicycle? And I don't think you'll be able to put a bike in these, but that's something to think about if, it, if you don't get this part of it. But we're also thinking of the trail may have to go around the tunnel, then come back down. But the route that's not in this corridor down there is what? Highway 43. And who wants to ride a bike on Highway 43? And here it is on the west side. There's a whole history. This is called the old Jefferson Street Line. The Southern Pacific Railroad ran all these commuter cars out to McMinnville and Newburgh. And I guess during the heyday, they ran like 60 trains a day, you know, before everyone had cars. And there was there were like a huge hotel there. People would go down and stay in this huge hotel, which is, has burnt down since. But the views are quite spectacular. And of course, as you go through the John's Landing area, see the northern section, we've already got a trail. So we just need to get down to the Salwood Bridge. Then the city has a park called Powers Marine Park. So just think from right here where the laser pointer is, you pretty much got a trail all the way there that's parallel to the streetcar. It's just this section down here that we want to have both. And the tunnel is kind of in this area. The tunnel's literally under, you know, the, you know, that mansion that's open. What's it called? With the gardens down there off. Pidoc. No, not Pidoc. It's. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but it's. Bishop's. Yeah, Bishop's Close, which is open. I highly recommend going to Bishop's Close. It's open to the public, and in the spring they have beautiful gardens. It's just off Highway 43. 
towards Lake Oswego. And when you get to Bishop's Close, you walk into the garden, you're, you're up on this high thing. And I believe the tunnel is underneath that. And from there, you see the whole Willamette River, and you see Milwaukee. And you see Elk Rock Island, which used to be owned by the owners. And it's owned by the, you know, the church, so it's open. they have a beautiful house there, too, that is open for uh, meetings and receptions. And here's another very urban trail in North Portland called Peninsula Crossing Trail. And I have a map coming up, but it's about almost four miles in North Portland. It connects Smith and Bybee Lake to the Willamette River. And what's neat about this, it's pretty much a street, a paper street that was never built by the city. So it's a public right of way, and we want, instead of building a street, the city never did anything. It was just overgrown blackberries and trees. So instead of having a trail built in the future, I mean a street, we said to the city, could that be a trail? Because the citizens who lived there came to Metro and asked us to do something in 95. So here is this, and it's, this part is done also, but it's, this light line shows the uh, Columbia Slough Trail. And here's the max, interstate max is right here. So we'll have a connection within a few blocks of the Max line. The Max line will actually go right over the Columbia Slough Trail. If you've seen that bridge up towards the Expo Center, which will have a big station there. But here's the Smith and Bobby Lakes owned by Metro Parks, and this is open to the public. And Pen Kelly Point Park is up here, and there's a trail you can literally ride up all the way to Kelly Point Park. Just imagine that. And the new jail, there's a jail trail up here. The, the new county jail is being built right now. And there will be a trail within walking distance of that trail. And we're looking at a trail that would cross the old landfill. You can see this whole circular trail. This is a very nice natural area. And then this is all kind of in a mishmash of industrial. And here's the wastewater treatment plant. But we actually got the trail across, the, oh, excuse me, the wastewater treatment plant's here and they have some ponds there. But it took years to coordinate with the city because the, it's still secure because the trail is fenced off from the actual treatment plant. So it goes on the perimeter around the plant and over a bridge that's multi-purpose. It's a bike pad bridge, but with a sewer pipe hidden underneath the deck of the bridge. So it's quite nice. And, and if you golf, there's the Heron's Golf Course is right over here. And the, the, the race track is right over here. The max line's here. And thousands of people here saying live in these old inner city neighborhoods. And here's the, the Columbia Villa redevelopment, the housing. So our trail is just like five blocks from that big housing change that's coming from public housing to a mixed use of incomes. And the University of Portland's right up here on the bluff. And the long-term goal is to have a trail down on the river's edge, Swan Island. You know, Swan Island used to be the airport in the 30s. Here's the St. John's Bridge. And here's, there's a trail down here right on the east side of the St. John's Bridge. The city owns this section. Then there are various brownfields in here owned by Metro and the state that eventually we hope to have a trail. This, you know, this doesn't show the topo lines, but there's quite a drop. And the, has anyone taken the train to Seattle? Well, I recommend a train trip to Vancouver. It sound, sounds odd, doesn't it? But you can take this train and see all the green spaces in the trails. Have you seen that? It's very interesting. And I did that recently, and luckily the train stopped for like five minutes. They had, to, for whatever reason, the train had to stop here. So it was quite amazing to see the vantage points from all this. And over here is the, uh, the electronics Vocker, the German company, is over here. So they have blocked of access. That was already done like 20 years ago. So from now, as planners, before development can go in down here, they have to dedicate a trail easement. And here's the, on the west side, you know, the burgeoning Washington County area, which is highly developed. There's actually a whole corridor that is, as people seen, it's like 100 to 200 feet wide. And sometimes there's a park. And it would, 
connect Forest Park all the way down the Tualatin River. And the neat thing is it can't happen because two miles are already done. So here's Forest Park, and here's this. But it's literally a very straight corridor because it, since it has all the power lines. But even though it's a straight line, it kind of goes up and down, so it's not level. And another trail in the Beaverton area is the Phantom Creek Greenway, which would connect from John's Landing right on the Willamette River all the way through West Portland, Beaverton, Durham, Tiger to the Tualatin River. And we worked with all those cities to complete a trail plan. You could see the trail is complete. There's a lot of wetlands and floodplain areas that you can't develop. Here are a lot of like high tech type companies, and here are all your traditional west side type of suburban subdivisions. This trail actually connects up to Washington Square. Believe it or not, they're doing a trail around Washington Square. So here's this Fano Trail. And we've actually just got funding to do a bike ped bridge over the Tualatin River. And TriMet in Washington County and these cities, they're actually putting together a project called the West Side High Speed Commuter Route. You may have heard of that. That's actually going to happen. They're going to put new trains on an existing railroad track that's owned by Burlington Northern Railroad. And they're going to have a, it's actually coming all the way from Wilsonville, which is down here. And they would connect up to the Beaverton Transit Station, so you could go onto the MAX line. <coughs> and that, that's actually happening. They're buying new types of trains from um, the companies in Vermont, Bombardier. They did the MAX. They were Canadian, but to meet the federal guidelines, they opened up a plant in Vermont, <laughs> which is across from Quebec. So that's happening. So I'm trying to work with TriMet to get like a trail paralleling the rail and, and at stations, like they'll have a Tigard station a that you could do an intermodal transfer. So that's kind of exciting. And this one is really happening. We're doing a lot of projects here. And then we have more of a recreational trail along the Tualatin River, which is the slowest moving river in the state. You can't tell which way upstream is, downstream. But it's essentially canoeing. So Metro's bought access points so you could launch a canoe. So this is more, remember we do recreation and commuter trails. And it's quite beautiful and there's a federal wildlife refuge just on the north side of Sherwood on 99W that's open to the public. And see this whole river canoeing, it's very popular in the summer months. And West Lynn has a very good canoe launching. I even highly recommend going on a canoe West Lynn down towards going all the way to Wilsonville because, you know, it curves up to Wilsonville, the river. That's on the Willamette. See, once you get to the Willamette, you can go from the... T and there's, I think there's just one or two spots here that have some... Portage. Yeah, we could have to do portage here. But pretty much it's very slow. But along the river trail, we want to have a land-based trail where possible, too. And this is in the East County, the Gresham Ferry. This is another one of those old streetcar lines that goes from the Springwater Trail all the way up to the Columbia River. So this is an, and the Max Station, Ruby Junction, if you ever take the Max line, it says Ruby Junction. This, that's in this area, that's where they park the trains at night and fix them up, the maintenance shops. So they're going for a 10 to 12 feet wide path with shoulders. And it goes through a lot of natural areas. It has a lot of sub subdivisions, of course, adjacent to it. But the nice thing is this swath of land is still there. And here it is. See that old streetcar line that you kept going to Estacada in the olden days? Or you could actually have gone up to here and cut over. Again, we had all these streetcar corridors. But this will be nice. This corridor is pretty much all the way available to like Burnside or Gle Halsey Street. You got this right away between four. There used to be a streetcar line and PG has poles there. But up here, this still needs to be figured out to get the corridor up to the 40-mile loop trail. 
this is very exciting because here you've got uh, Blue Lake Park right here. This is Blue Lake and this is Fairview Lake, okay? And here's that one we talked about earlier, the Beaver Creek Canyon Trail. It's up in Troutdale. This, this was built, this is a law, a tree that just fell down one day in a storm. So instead of chopping it up, they just built a boardwalk on top of this big tree. And we're, our goal is to connect this behind the Troutdale Outlet Molly. <laughs> you know that when you're going up the gorge, the Troutlet, Troutdale stores are within 15 blocks, just to show you how this is a remnant natural area. But the nice thing is they're actually going to cut open into that outlet mall. Then you'll see this Sandy River. There's actually the Sandy River is behind that outlet mall. It's quite amazing. <laughs> and we've got, I've walked under I-84. We can walk under the trail under I-84. Right now it's just like a whole boat community. But you literally can stand between the east and west lanes of I-84 up by the Sandy River. And that, that's that trail, you know, the out. See, the nice thing is it gets into Gresham. The, you know, these areas are just being, houses are being built here like crazy. And here's the, you probably, many of you may have the regional bike map that Metro sells for like $5. And it shows all the routes throughout the whole region that you could ride your bike on a traditional striped bike lane. And we're also putting together a, a booklet on how to build and manage trails that are environmental friendly because, you know, we want people out of their cars, right? We want people to ride. We want them to get healthy because Oregon has a very notorious obesity rate. But yet we don't want to ruin the environment because you got like, should it be pervious or impervious? What do you do with the runoff that hits it? Do you want a soft surface or a hard surface? You don't want to impact the creek negatively. If you have a trail next to a creek, do you have to do a boardwalk, which is very expensive? Do you use traditional cedar or do you lumber or pressurized cedar or do you use the plastic recycled wood? There's all sorts of. Uh, just a question of uh, expense. When you, uh, are you competing for like any federal funds? I know the, uh, the max, I'm sure you get money for that from federal but like the smaller trails, how do you fund, you know, those or is it any incentives you get from PGE by making utility lines along or like using the uh, old trolleys? What type of funds or federal well, funds are you competing for? Yeah, we do, we do compete against highways and bridges. Metro coordinates all the federal transportation funds, you know, which is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So in the last six years, Four to six years, we made a lot of progress in competing against the road projects, which they always fund the road projects first. So we kind of get what's left over. But we have been, we've put together a lot of the trail and park planners. Because I'm a trail and park planner, and we have the least power. If you, ever, if you guys become planners, or I don't know if some of you are professional planners, we're at the bottom <laughs> of the scale. And I don't mean this jokingly, because the funding is controlled by the transportation planners, like how you write a grant and get it a good score. So I always tell the park planners to make an alliance with the transportation planners. And in between, the two of us are the land use planners. We do all the permits and stuff, which can really jack up the cost of your project because of all the environmental rules. Because to build this trail along the Willamette River, we're in the Willamette Greenway, it took a year to get a permit for a trail because of ESA and the Greenway requirements. You know, you'd think we were building a highway down there in a sense. So you could kind of hear, think about how the developers are so mad at agencies where here you have another branch of the government and it takes a whole year to get a permit. But you, we are working with the transportation funding group to get more like a special allocation for trails, but it, that hasn't happened per se. But see, you were talking about this is kind of leading, this might lead it up to your question. So we have a lot of funding issues. We're also trying to get system development charges, like when developers go and they set aside. When you build a house, you have to set aside a thousand or two of that house for parks. 
So then they use that money to build trails. So there, there are all sorts of things. We're following up on the funding, have you used uh, the transportation enhancements money that comes from uh, federal government? Yes, that the transportation enhancement funds are federal transportation monies passed through Oregon Department of Transportation ODOT, and since they're doing a statewide pool, there is um, competition from every community. But we did get money for the Tualatin Bike Ped Bridge from that pot, nine hundred ninety thousand dollars. To answer your question, that was exciting. So this is a quote from, and Morgan just left, but one of our projects that we're trying to convince a, a study, and I think we met with Professor Bertini in the city a couple of weeks, and we're trying to get some engineering and planning students to start doing some case study work for the Sullivan's Gulch Trail. See this, it's a, that would be on the north side of the railroad tracks. So that would be an actual case study that would be useful to the governments because we currently have no money to send consultants or staff out there to get information about what's possible. So that could be a very interesting one for the engineering students and the, the community workshop class that I think Ethan teaches in the spring. So that's something I'd like to talk to you guys, to you about and you know, your students. So that, and I want to say the other award-winning project PSU students did for us was the Trolley Trail mini feasibility study. They did a very good project for Metro about two years ago. Six students from the community workshop. They put together a really good PowerPoint presentation, a whole document that helped us launch into the trolley trail. Then we got federal funding for. So we're actually, that's actually going to happen in five years. So it's kind of neat that students helped us put together a project and within five years a big chunk of that trail is going to happen. So uh, you must have heard from my, <laughs> I wish Morgan was here because at the end I had to just leave. And he, Morgan's been bugging me for the last three years to do that. <laughs> and I try to follow through. And he's been really good. He's come to the Metro Camp. I mean, one citizen actually can make a difference. He, he actually came to all the public hearings and went to the Metro Council and got this put on our map. You know, he had Metro vote on. Unfortunately, the city of Portland hasn't put it on their map. It usually goes on the city map, then it comes to the metro regional map. But in this case, there was interest at our end, and Morgan did a great job of selling it. So now we're working with the city to get it on their maps. And I think if the students here and in engineering help us, we can get more information. <coughs> it's a tough project because you got an active railroad, Union Pacific, and they're moving 60 miles. They move fast. And you got Max, which is moving fast. But there is actually <coughs> clearances through every street crossing, you know, all those overpasses. On the north side, there's actually a gap, for, because obviously the trains go through, right? But there's actually maintenance roads down there that people could use. And we're also going to look at up on the bluff, too, if you know that area that the trail could go. And you could go up and down and come back. And as new development goes in there, we want to work with them to make them dedicate an easement. Um, living in the Sullivan's Gulch area and yeah. being an outdoorsman and all that stuff, I'd have to ask why you would want to put a pedestrian bike trail into a heavy transportation corridor with all the noise and all the bad air quality issues that you've got to deal with. Well, this, this is seen more as a, a commuter connection trail for commute, people who would work in the Lloyd District or downtown. But that's a good question. It's kind of like the East Bank. Esplanade, because a lot of, which is, there's certain sections that are so noisy. Under the Morrison Bridge, if you stand there for more than five minutes, you will get a massive headache. But as it juts out away from the river, it's not so bad. It's kind of that question, and most people are just kind of going through their commuting or recreating at lunch. So it's the same thing. This is more of a commuter trip. You're right, because it's not like the most beautiful area. It's just like the long term trail for going up through some of these industrial areas around Swan Island and some of these brown. The brown fields have potential in the next 20 years once they're capped that they could someday have housing if they deem it safe enough. So you could, 
theoretically have a community down there with the river. But in this case, Sullivan's Gulch I-84, you've got this narrow corridor. You're always going to have the trains in I-84 there. But we're also looking on top of it. If you notice the west end right above where Metro Office is, there's a whole bluff that has amazing views of the whole downtown, and that could be a trail. When, when we say corridor now, we're not just limiting it down in the gully. To get a lot of the different transportation funding, grant funds, um, do you have to show that your project can, does have a strong commuter component to it? Or can you, or, or will it qualify just based on recreational? For the transportation funds, they must show commuter potential. Because the transportation funds will fund trails, but only if they have a commuter purpose. But there are state recreational funds that just do recreation, so you have to apply to this other pot of money. So it's very complex. Because the transportation grants, some of the grants, you only have to have a 10% local match. Remember, you have to match your federal, so that is a smaller pot. And the monies are bigger. You can get like a million dollars or more. But in these state grants, you have to have 50% local match and apply st compete statewide. The good thing about the regional transportation funds there's a set allocation for the metro area. But again, only a very small percentage, I think less than 5%, would go for trails currently. Uh, I don't, you don't have to go. Uh, I want to ask you to go back and describe all this for every trail, but you didn't really mention like what surface some of the trails are going to have. Um, when you outlined, what about 10 or 15 trails the past hour? Is it going to be all cement, or is it well, going to be it's it's it varies trail by trail. So currently, the regional trails we've done are 12 feet wide, pervious or impervious asphalt, with two foot shoulders that usually are gravel or bark dust. If further out, we could have, we'd have horses using their sides. But concrete is like very expensive. So I could see concrete maybe in the urban, urban area, like down on the waterfront, you've seen concrete trails. But like the power line trail, that 15th swath down a power line corridor in Beaverton, it's what's there now is asphalt, and I think the future would be asphalt. And in some areas where you have wet areas, you may have to do boardwalks, which are very expensive. So and that's, that's why we have those general guidelines. It's a kind of a case by case. And some trails may have combinations, depending if it, the trail ends up near a wetland. You can't build in a wetland, but you can if you put a boardwalk, because that's a, you know, it, it's not right into the water. What's the plan to link up the trolley trail with the spring water trail? Like, is there a good connection for those two? Yeah, if you, see, if you look in your map here, it's called 17th Avenue. It's If you look at Trail 34 and 30, there's a little gap, and it's, I'm working on it. It's called Southeast 17th Avenue, and there's a bike lane there now, but there's no sidewalk. So there's like a 10 block, 10, <coughs> 10 to 15 block separation from the spring water to the trolley trail. So John's question, it, it's kind of, here's the spring water and the three bridges. So there's a section there that currently has bike lanes, but you, there's no sidewalks. So the solution is to put in sidewalks there or to go east and look at Johnson Creek and could you cram a trail down there. But if you look between 17th Avenue and McLaughlin, it's highly industrialized with lots of warehouses. So those are our two options there. But it's going to be a high, see this trolley trail? This is going to be done in five years. The bridges are done in three years. This is done. This is done. You're going to have a lot of movement east to west and north to south. So that kind of 10 block area is very crucial. Oh. About how much does it cost annually to maintain the trails? 
Well, we have the average is since the trails are devolved down by to each city parks department, like the city of Portland maintains its trails, Beaverton maintains. So, kind of a rule of thumb is like five to six thousand a mile per year. And some trails are maintained like twice a year. You could probably notice that, and they have a lot of volunteers helping out in between. Is that it? That's fine. Any additional questions? Okay. Um, I was wondering, besides um, opposition from property owners who, for one reason or another, don't want a trail near their house, what's the biggest obstacle you face from the public when you're trying to build a trail? Well, besides the opposition, and which the opposition includes like privacy and crime issues. Yeah. That's kind of one yeah. category. Well, sometimes people are saying, even though it's a small amount of money, why aren't you putting all the money into roads and highways? How many people will really, will this really be used? They may not be against it, but they're just wondering, if you spend this money for a trail, will it actually be used? That sort of, it's usually, it's usually the first. We don't, there doesn't seem to be a big, the people leave, they hate them. But then a lot of times after they're built, they find out they're not as bad as they thought they were. That's, you know, that's a case by case, true, generally true statement. But it seems like they're really opposed. Then they find out, well, it's been planned, so we should sit down with you and work with you to put in like not vegetation there so it doesn't look like just a piece of asphalt through their neighborhood. But I would say beyond the, they're against that they're afraid of crime lack of privacy, it's, will people really use it? I, I think I asked this to someone last year, but is, is anything, is there any consideration in, in busy areas like the Hawthorne Bridge to separate pedestrians from uh, rollerbladers and bicyclists? That, you know, that's, you know, that's strictly at the city level, but I know what you mean, because if you, you know, what I get most upset when I use that trail is if you go to the right, people are not staying to the right. They're coming right at you. Unless you want to have a collision, somebody's got to give. But people need to follow to the right. And you know, the traffic side, there's not a little rail. You could actually fall in to the oncoming tree. Have you noticed that? And they, they, this is actually wider than it used to be. After they repainted the Hawthorne Bridge a few years ago, they widened. The, the actual pedestrian bike area. But short of putting a line in, which a lot of people don't like, so you know, stay on the right for sure because it's striped. In Seattle, in Green Lake Park, which is massively used, they actually have a section for feet. They call it like the, if you're walking and the, anything with wheels for bikes and rollerbladers. But I don't know, if, I think, has Roger Geller I mean, Courtney Duke, there, he's the bike planner and she's the pedestrian planner for the city. But I think you need to bring up those questions. Otherwise, especially at lunch, there's such a, such a use, it's very dangerous in a sense. So that's a city decision to kind of not to say it's the city's, but it is. But I, I, I know what you mean. Sort of a follow up on that, though. Has conflicts between pedestrians and bicyclists? was come up on any of your separate trails? Well, that's why we're trying to keep to a regional standard and or guideline of 12 feet with the two foot shoulders. Because the shoulder you could pull off kind of in an emergency if it's, so if we have 12 feet with two feet shoulders, we have enough width. But at pinch point areas on this new trail where there's areas that the land just wouldn't allow 12 feet trail, we had to put in a striped line <coughs> to keep people from conflicting. Because if you're in a group of walkers, you're rarely going to walk single file, because that just doesn't happen. So, you, so the bicyclists, a lot of them say behind or they ring their bell. There's kind of an etiquette type thing that people are starting to learn on these more multi-use, shared use path trails. So you need to be assertive, even if you don't like to ring your bell or say, on your left, if you're a bicyclist, you need to say that because the pedestrian will actually appreciate that. Because they're out there having a good time, the walkers, a lot. 
and you're getting a lot of more seniors and you're getting people with baby carriages so you have to just be alert on the crowd especially the Hawthorne Bridge <laughs> you know you have to be very careful because you got the traffic right there if you fall into that you get hit by a bus or the car at least on the multi-pass the ones that I'm doing mostly have the shoulder Uh, I didn't hear. I, maybe uh, at Metro, is there an open space component in, in your trails or greenway planning? Yeah, I, I, I don't know if you heard that at the beginning. The, the major component is open. It's open spaces and trails. So we, over the last eight years, we've purchased 8,000 acres of big open spaces. And go to our website, too. I highly recommend that because it will show all the lands we've purchased. But they're land banked. We don't have money to open up those 8,000 acres. They're only open by appointment or special tours. So if your group wanted a tour, we could arrange it. Because we, we're trying to figure out how to get money to put in some trailheads and trails and bathrooms or honey buckets. And that's the next level. The first level, we were told by the public through this vote, buy them before they're developed. Even if we can't get to them, we know they'll be there. And then that's the next level. You were talking a little bit about um, your vision statement or kind of the plan with the healthy communities. Have you ever uh, thought about or does this work if when you target, let's say, school children and going to, let's say, some of these trails actually yeah. maybe link up close to schools? Right. Have you ever, you ever gone or have you ever like used, like, let's say, AmeriCorps worker because I did AmeriCorps before and I know some people that worked at Metro to like go, go to schools and give any presentations where they could potentially use the schools that where these trails could connect to and try to promote yeah, that a little uh, bit to get it known? Yeah, we have some of the bike planners. It's called the Safe Routes to Schools program. Uh, then I, I played squash with the guy who does uh, the bicycles for kids, low-income kids, the community bicycle. Yeah, up in North. Daniel, do you know Daniel Bond? But generally, it's the, our bike planners work more closely with them. On one trail that I'm working on now, the trolley trail, we have one school literally on the trail. And it's an it's a uh, elementary school. So we're starting to work with them. But that's a good point, because you've got all the future riders and to connect. And a lot of the people at the city work with them, like Roger Geller, who's their bike coordinator, would work with the program. They actually give grants for education, and they've got, they want you to donate your bike so they can fix them up, too. As I just, this is kind of an adjunct, but has anyone been to Arcata, California? Northern California is kind of that green city. They actually have a bike library where they, they get all these donated used bikes and volunteers fix them up. And you just show up and you leave a $20 deposit and you get a bike for six months. And if you're a tourist, I was just there as a tourist, and you, you don't have to live there to get your bike car. You just put a $20 deposit, refundable. And so they even want, if you're there for two days, they want you to just ride your bike. And they have this whole thing of tying to the university there. See, here we're urban. I don't know what percentage of people even ride bikes. Or like Eugene or Corvallis, tons of bicyclists. Whereas here it's a little different. But I think you're right. Education is very important from the kids all the way up to the adults to follow the state of the right and to notify pedestrians. Any more questions? Well, great. And actually, this is a great segue into next week's speaker, who's actually Phil Goff from the city of Portland talking about uh, bicycle friendly Portland 101. So good transition. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. I want to thank you very much and uh, thank all of you for coming. Hope we see you again.